Our screen rewinds from a mud puddle. The fourth wall rebuilds itself. And our picture reverts back to crystal clear reception. Let's begin. Why is the butterfly the only insect that gets an effect named after it? Brad utters, hunting a moth. It hovers, bothers his bedroom light, taps the bulb devoted, batters itself silly on the ceiling. I'm sure whoever threw it up didn't mean to leave any other bugs out. Follows Joe, ever eager to oppose. Ben, the third friend, marvels at the window muted. Spies outside at outsiders passing by. Too monged to even move his tongue. The gormless group just finished up a couple zoots in the midst of a quick trip to the local corner shop to restock. Need more papers to roll, no pipes presently available. Well, uh, I think... Eyes glazed over, basically comatose. Brad needs a little longer to compose. There could be a moth effect of a similar premise. Is this another one of your far-out, bizarre, Nobel Prize-winning ideas? This is taking the piss. Let's go. Joe, all I know is these tricky little cunts munch on my clothes have been for weeks. And we're going to catch this fucking prick before we leave. If it wasn't for this little shit, loads of stuff would be different. We'd have papers to roll by now with our heads well in the clouds for at least an extra half an hour. But what's the big difference between the butterfly and your moth effect, then? It's just, the image of a butterfly implies it's been minding its own business. Plants itself on a pretty flower, gets stepped on by something too gigantic to notice, can't help it one bit. Well, with this moth. This tiny, flying thing's undying instinct makes it feel like it's imposing its changes upon me. Whoa. That's deep, man. Oi, me and this moth have a lot in common. I pour it mindless as it chases the light. That makes us somewhat alike. Brad's right. Because if that moth had a human hand, it would have grabbed Brad by the scruff of the neck to have kept him stuck inside that night. You see, this specific moth's design is beyond all rival, as insides more minuscule than the finest hair follicles and only requires a nano amount of power. Yet, what surges up the nerves of that wily invertebrate could invigorate the most titanic Tyrannosaurus Rex alike. But alas, dinosaurs aren't alive and lack the right size or devices to fly that close to a Croydon flat, making the moth the perfect life form for the job on this one. Spaces most suburban stars synchronize, cosmos blush in formation. Gods fiddle with their Milky Way grey beards, nestled up in nebulas aeons away, send emergency Chinese whispers gallivanting across galaxies all the way to Earth, which decide Brad doesn't die today. In this universe, no sir. Basically, the boys didn't notice the noise. But there was a car crash down the road in the direction of the shop they were about to pop into, and Brad would have got caught in the crossfire of Audi versus lamppost if five minutes, 54 seconds earlier, they had left the house uninterrupted like he wanted. 
the moth decides to settle for a second, sears itself on the scorched glass, just to see what the gleam it feeds off feels like. That's when the paper collides. The clueless kid kills his unlucky guardian angel. The god's message must have got messed up in the whisper because no deity decided on homicide this time. Well, I suppose that's over. Can we go now? Joe proposes, about ready to blow. I don't know what triggered it, but lately I've been bewitched by a lot of pretty existential questions. Brad's magnetic index finger, eager to fix itself upon the wondrous mechanics of his planet. He's always been ambitious. While Ben's first sentence in 20 minutes is... It's probably because you've been smoking more weed lately, isn't it? Yeah, probably paranoia. But recently, I ain't known what to think. Bruv, you want the truth? You're on telly, and we're the actors in it. Oh, fuck off. Oi, I'll admit it. You're a television star, we're the cast, and the best part is, you'll never be able to prove that we aren't. Like that Jim Carrey film. What's it called again? You know the one I'm on about. Joe chuckles, Brad utters. What a mug. He's not that gullible. Although unknown in the rear of the near mirror. As Joe maintains his hair, wipes his nose, wishes he owned more designer clothes carelessly. Analysts stand there, taking notes and make jokes about how he reckons the extra money spent would make him look sexier. Meanwhile, worldwide, another million or so watch The Joe Show, surveying wide-eyed, gaping, nocturnal, crooked neck like owls from their leather perch lounge as thousands of actors gather to give the impression that Joe's world is actual. The fact of it all is behind his bedroom wall is a film crew and his globe's revolved around by a crane moon which constantly shoots as producers constantly loot. Download season three of Joe for the low, low price of 19.99, featuring Joe learning how to ride a horse and the hilarious best of the bed wetting. Viewers scrutinize from a future millennium because they find it funny how we functioned. The most basic Jersey cow grazes, gazes out into a matrix field. The greenest grass smells, tastes, and even feels like the real deal. Our average Joe, an amalgamation of everything he's paid attention to as follows. First cartoons, then boobs, and finally the news. Man, neither of these idiots know shit about existence. Oh yeah? Go on then, Ben. Please free us from our ignorance. Mm. Well, I know you exist solely in the instance you're thinking. I mean, I think, therefore I am, and all that. So regardless of what reality actually is or has, it can only be what we perceive with our senses in the moment we have. Memory was installed for survival. Uh, history is conceived by humans, so past, by default, will always be somewhat false. All right, Descartes. Brad imparts the way friends tend to get rude when topics get too smart for them to argue. Which is why, in the grandest of schemes, the best thing to do is basically I don't give a shit about anything. The future is, like you said, Brad, consequential. All consequences are possible, parallel to us, which renders our present a roulette to begin with, among all the others. Now that's the end of Ben's two cents. There is no spoon to bend. Humans will always be foolish and the universe will continue to bloom. According to Einstein, those are the only two constants.
and these three teens proved it. However, Hawkin depicts space in the shape of a double helix, comes back on itself circular. Think of the infinity symbol if you need an example. Depart from the bottomless jet black pit of Ben's inner pupil. Out of Brad's single cell bedroom towards the orbit. Here below the wrinkle roads, now above the atlas, our glorious orb looks like a navy green pea. Blast past all the stars, they zoom past us like they do in Star Wars. Hit the back barrier, the black hole at the end of it all. Let it wrap you up in the rapture of dark matter before it spits you back out the deepest noir of Ben's ocular parts back to where we started. Just like that, the present reverses back to the first verse when the boys first began talking. However, it's a different rendition, a conclusion of everything that would have happened and more if there was no more before the boys left the corner store. Our screen rewinds from a mud puddle. The fourth wall rebuilds itself, and our picture reverts back to crystal clear reception. Let's begin. Let's go. All right.